Yes, I am, the AI said. I glanced at the orcs who were watching me with concern plain on their faces. If I were in their place, I'd be alarmed too. Hell, I probably should be, and this machine in my head is likely the reason I'm not. On the other hand, a lot of things make sense now. The translations, the shape of my magic pathways, the speed with which I've been picking up skills, all of it can be attributed to ten. I met eyes with Yisith. I'm coming with you, I stated. The silence I had broken returned much heavier than before. Yaisith, Joni, Yulk, and Matri looked confused. Nash looked angry, which is quickly becoming his default expression. Thunra crossed his arms and grinned widely at me. How come? Thunra asked. Our investigation has resulted in more questions than answers, I replied. There might be more information where the monster is. Plus, it turns out I'm a mechanically assisted fighter. Nash stopped looking angry. The machine helps you fight? Yeah. My answer was met with silent contemplation, but after a few moments, Thunra started shifting uncomfortably. He looked to the others and then locked eyes with me. I don't know what everybody else is thinking about, but you're still level five, ain't you? He asked. The thing we're going to be fighting killed orcs that were a bunch of levels above you. Is the machine thingy going to be able to help you that much? It was a valid question, and one I didn't know the answer to. But what else can I do? I have to find out more about how I got here so I can figure out how to get back. I need to get back. 10. Do you have an answer to his question? I thought. Yes, I do, Ten responded hesitantly. I'm learning that the Curaguard system measures level primarily based on skills, not actual physical ability. My assumption is that physical ability is either augmented by skills or gained by the process of acquiring those skills and is thus accounted for in that way. So in theory, I should be able to augment your physical capabilities to a degree that would put you on par with higher level monsters. How much higher? Unknown. Haven't even seen you walk yet, Ten said. With more data, I'll be able to bypass your body's natural self-defense systems, causing you to hit harder and faster. The human body underestimates its own abilities by quite a bit, it would seem. Bypassing my self-defense system sounds pretty dangerous. The self-defense systems overcorrect to make certain that you don't hurt yourself when you throw a punch or a kick. I can make that correction with a much more narrow margin, allowing you to use more force without hurting yourself. Okay. Ten says it can help, but it doesn't know by how much, I told Thunra. It would be safest if I stayed in the rear so I probably wouldn't be holding you back. Probably? Shit, Thunra said. I want to see what you can do, kid, but... Yeah, I'm not sure that we can keep you safe, Matri added. There's another problem, Nash said coldly. Yolk and I would have to go as well. Mom would never forgive us if we didn't, even if you survive. He's right. Yulk chimed in. Still, if we stay in the rear, we should be fine. There's no doubt that four over-twenties will keep the monster busy enough to ignore us. I don't know. I've got a bad feeling about this, Nash replied. Yulk and I stared at Nash while he mulled it over. After a few moments, Thunra and Matri joined in on the staring. Finally, Yisith crossed her arms and began to glare at Nash. Nash looked around and settled his gaze on me. Fine. He sighed heavily. We stay in the back, though. If things go south, we run. Deal? Deal, Yulk and I lied in unison. I stood up and was struck by how different I felt. Lighter, faster, and much stronger. I didn't know if it was Ten or the table responsible for this, but it felt amazing. As I followed after the orcs, I noticed something else was different. I was nervous, but my heart wasn't hammering away in my chest. It was beating its normal rhythm as if I didn't have a care in the world. Ten, are you controlling my heart? I asked the machine. No, just regulating it. Saving you some energy by making sure your heart rate stays steady, Ten answered. Would you like me to stop? It's fine. Are you also regulating my muscles? I haven't quite figured that function out yet. Working on it, though. Well, that answers the question of whether it was Ten or the table that gave me my power up. What did that thing do to me? I looked at my hands. My scar had become even smaller, which means that the table somehow healed me. What else did it do? Ten? Is there anything weird about my body? Ten took a second to respond and said, 
Define weird. What are the differences between my body and that of a normal human? Huh. Now that I think about it, your bones and muscles are denser than they should be. Not quite to the point of osteopetrosis, but we should definitely add at least five pounds of fat to you before you try to go swimming. What? I asked. Why? Well, it's extremely unlikely that you're still buoyant, which means it will take much more effort and energy to keep you above water. The fat will help offset your density. It'll also provide an energy source to keep you moving, Ten replied cheerfully. I put my hand on my stomach to feel my abs. They were more pronounced than they'd ever been, probably because I had been working out a lot more. I guess nothing gets you more ripped than being in a survival situation. Five pounds? Isn't that unhealthy? No, Ten answered. It varies from individual to individual, but for you it'll begin to become a health concern at around 20 pounds. However, I can mitigate those health risks with proper deposit placement, keeping the deposits off of the heart, liver, and kidneys, that sort of thing. However, given your current condition, my recommendation is to gain between 5 and 10 pounds of fat. I briefly wondered if 10 had been programmed by my grandmother. It's not that I don't believe it. I'd heard interviews with strongmen that said that abs mean you're not eating enough. But is it really all that bad to be this lean? Most guys would kill to be in the shape that I'm in, not to mention how the hell I'm supposed to pack on that much weight to begin with. My thoughts regarding my nutritional intake were interrupted by our arrival at the barrier. It had been a long walk in both directions, but I wasn't feeling any exhaustion. My feet didn't even hurt. We'll take a break and recover a bit before we take down the barrier, Yeseth said. Yolk and Gino sighed with relief and plopped onto the ground. The rest of us soon followed suit, and we ate a small meal in silence. After I finished eating, I caught myself staring at the barrier, watching the runes peacefully drift across its purple surface. It reminded me of floating down a river on an inner tube. The last time I'd done that was with Cass, before she got sick. It had been a great time. I remember watching the water droplets slowly slide down her clavicle. That's gone, Ten interrupted. What? I asked, startled. What do you mean that's gone? I mean that the runes you are staring at are in gone, it explained. It says traversal prohibited. Hey, Yolk, did you know that the runes on the barrier are in gone? Joni and Yolk both looked up at me with surprising speed. What do they say? They asked in unison. It just says traversal prohibited, I said. But that's weird, right? They thought about it for a moment before Yulk spoke up. I guess it's not that weird. Most of the spells we know, and barrier spells especially, were created back when Gon was the primary written language. That's correct, Joni added. Scholars used Gon for quite a while after people started using more modern languages. It's good at condensing information, which unfortunately makes it difficult to translate and teach. And since it's harder for people to admire your brilliance when they can't understand what you're writing, Gon was abandoned in favor of modern languages, Yolk chuckled. I don't think it was quite that simple, Joni began. Before he could continue, Yisith patted her pants and stood up. She cracked her neck and looked at the two sorcerers with a hint of disdain. Well, if we're feeling energetic enough to debate linguistics, we should have enough energy to continue on, she said. Any objections? Two seconds of silence confirmed that there were none. After a few sighs, we all rose to our feet. Thunra, you'll take the lead. Matri and I will be flanking a few feet back. Joni, you'll be behind us, and you three will be behind him, she said, gesturing at Yulk, Nash, and I. Classic diamond formation. Nice, Thunra said. Everyone get your lights ready. If you need one, I've got extra. I'll need it, Nash said. Nick and I should be fine, Yolk added. I gave him a confused look and he grinned at me. The guild sack, he said, holding a finger above his head. A light appeared at the tip of his finger and hovered in place. He moved and the light followed. Then he gestured at me. Go on, give it a try. Okay, light. No problem. Protons? Electrons? Which is it that generates light? Wait, am I overthinking this? Imagine a ball of light appearing from your fingertip. I recommend setting the generation point above your right shoulder, Ten instructed. Okay, thank you, I replied. 
I pointed above my shoulder like Ten said and thought about a ball of light, how it would look, how it would feel, white, bright, and slightly warm. To guilt sack, I heard myself say. I felt the magic travel from my chest through my arm and out my fingertip. The light appeared where I was pointing, just like it did with Yulk. I smiled a little when I noticed mine was brighter than his, though. There you go, Yulk said with a laugh. It's a basic spell, but far more useful than most people give it credit for. The rest of the adventurers activated their various lights. Joni used a spell like Yulk and I but everyone else tapped on crystals that were embedded in their clothing. Nash took the spare from Yisith and held it in his off hand like a flashlight. All right, weapons out, Yisith commanded. Joni, kill the barrier. We drew our weapons and Joni cracked his knuckles before approaching the barrier. Thunra walked up next to him, grinned, and cracked his own knuckles much louder. The sorcerer rolled his eyes and placed his fingers on the barrier. He said something quietly and the runes on the barrier rushed to its center, creating a strange-looking opaque bump. Joni placed his hand on the bump and said, Imesa's Nepo. The barrier quickly shrank into the bump, transforming it into a crystal. It began to fall, and Joni caught it with a quick motion. He placed the crystal in his pocket and gestured down the passageway. After you, he grinned at Thunra. Thunra nodded and started walking. We all fell into formation with Nash and I flanking Yulk and ventured into the darkness, being careful to avoid the damaged portions of the floor. The shredded bricks definitely looked like some kind of plastic, and I recalled the notch in my sword. What kind of material could this be? And what the hell could slice through it? I looked closer at the slashed lights and had a moment of shock. For some reason I had been expecting fluorescent lighting, but these were solid chunks of what looked like glass. I shook it off, realizing that fluorescent bulbs would require power, and every other source of light so far had been either fire or magic. I suppose these would fall into the latter category. We went further and further into the dark, until the passage opened up into a room with pillars. I noticed that this room was brown, an odd color compared to everything else in this area of the dungeon. Then the smell of copper and rot hit me. Something deep within me recoiled at the stench, desperately trying to tell me that something was terribly wrong. Blood, Yulk whispered. As we continued forward, we began to see splashes of white, and I realized with terror that the room wasn't brown. So many people had died in this room that it was drenched in blood. That's disgusting. Horrible. What could have done this? What kind of monster are we going to fight? What the hell was I thinking dragging us in here? We need to get out of here. My heart thundered in my head as panic rose within me, and I nearly threw up before a wave of calm swept over me. Tens messing with my brain chemistry, making me calmer, letting me think. I sighed in relief, but almost retched again at the smell. Suddenly, we stopped. I looked past Yisith, and the feeling of terror hit me again, and was just as quickly washed away. Someone was standing in front of us, completely nude. He stood there staring with sunken eyes and a small yet deeply unsettling smile. The creature's skin was unnaturally pale with the exception of both old and new scars covering it, like pink and purple paint slashed onto a bleached canvas. Long claws gleamed in the light that we were providing, and the fur running along its body was as white as the long hair draping down from its head. It mouthed a word without uttering a single sound but I knew what it said. I'd seen mouths make that motion hundreds of times. In perfect English, it had mouthed the word food. A cold knot formed in my stomach as it grinned, and I saw teeth in a shape that I hadn't seen since I'd come to this world, except in my own reflection. Thread identified, human male, likely modified and acclimated to dark environments, Ten informed me. I didn't even get to respond before it rushed forward with unbelievable speed. Its target was Thunra, who managed to catch the creature by the wrists before the claws impaled his head. I could tell the orc was struggling, but the thing continued smiling. Yisith and Matri moved in unison so quickly I nearly didn't see them, weapons reaching for the creature's sides. It leapt into the air and kicked in both directions. 
As Yi Sith and Matri were flying across the chamber, it smashed both its knees into Thunra's jaw. Thunra crumpled to the ground, but before the creature could finish him off, Joni shouted something and flung a fiery blue and white spear at him. Without dropping its smile, the creature rolled out of the way and flung a piece of metal that was on the ground at the sorcerer, striking him in the chest and causing him to fall. It dashed forward with its claws ready to finish Joni, when suddenly it stopped dead and sniffed the air. I watched its smile fade as its head turned toward me. My eyes locked with its sunken black orbs, and it sniffed the air again. It was about to target me. I need to take the initiative. I readied my sword and began to charge at the thing. Nash shouted, Nick, no, you'll... And the creature gave a deafening screech filled with wretched hatred and rage, drowning out the rest of what Nash was trying to say. Threat exceeds your current abilities, Ten said in my head, engaging combat mode. I didn't even get the chance to ask what it meant before darkness invaded my vision, and I slipped into oblivion. Joni crumpled to the ground, gasping for air. I hefted my axe, prepared to intercept the creature as it rushed forward. Then the thing suddenly froze in its tracks and slowly turned to Nick, sniffing the air. I stopped and looked at the boy as well. I watched as his face changed from an expression of fear to one of grim determination. In no time at all, he readied his sword for a slash and charged at the creature. Nick, no, you'll... I managed to shout before the creature's shriek cut me off. It was a terrible sound, filled to the brim with bile and fury. It was loud enough to hurt and I instinctively blocked my ears. I watched in horror as Nick's eyes glazed over and he stumbled for a brief moment. Then he caught himself and rushed forward at an incredible speed, faster than I'd ever seen him move even with Dash. The creature recoiled at first, then leapt at Nick with its claws at the ready. Nick ducked the claws and brought his sword up in a slash. The creature contorted midair, avoiding a fatal blow. The thing leapt back from Nick, and I watched blood drop from its left forearm. My breath caught in my throat as I realized that it was hanging on by a loose flap of flesh, the bone having been cleaved clean through. Fucking hells, Yulk whispered. Nick immediately rushed after the creature with his sword low to the ground, going for another upward slash. The creature grabbed its arm, holding it in place, and with a screech, it fell back. Nick chased after it but the creature managed to stay just outside of his range, leaping off of the pillars to increase its speed. Nick changed up his attack pattern and attempted an overhand slash, but the creature ducked him and landed a hard kick that sent him back several feet. My blood ran cold as I realized that the same kind of kick that had sent the over-twenties flying didn't even phase the boy. His eyes were locked on the creature, and his face was devoid of any expression at all. The creature, on the other hand, was grinning once again. It extended its arms like a bird, and it took a second for me to register that it wasn't bleeding anymore. The damage that Nick had done was completely healed. Nick, use your magic, like with the rats, I shouted. The boy didn't seem to hear me, or at least he didn't act as if he did. He held his sword straight out in front of him in a sort of bastardized fencing stance. It was pointed directly at the creature, and in response, the creature curled its fingers until each and every claw it had was pointed directly at Nick's head. I was so enraptured by this standoff that I didn't even notice Thunra get off the ground. He exploded upward with a curse and immediately launched a haymaker into the back of the creature's head. The thing didn't even get another scream out before Nick was on him. The boy's blade suddenly appeared through the creature's back, and with a flourish, Nick slashed sideways fully severing its arm in the process. The creatures gurgled another scream, but it managed to knee Nick in the chest, and in the same motion elbow Thunra in the face with its remaining arm. The brawler once again flew back and hit the ground, but Nick used the momentum from the blow and slashed again and again. The creature managed to deflect and block these attacks, but it was giving ground fast. Blood poured from its arm and the hole in its side. So much blood. Too much blood. Why won't it fucking die? Go down, you rotten fuck! I half shouted, half prayed. Suddenly, Yi Seath was back in the fray, supporting Nick as best as she could. The beast and the boy were moving at speeds that made my head spin, though, and she was barely managing to help. I realized that Yulk and I had no chance of helping. I've never felt so weak and helpless. 
I gritted my teeth as I watched Nick and Yeseth trade blows with the creature. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Yulk move. I glanced away from the fight and watched my brother kneel over Thunra. The brawler's nose was barely connected to his face, and one of his eyes was hanging out of his head by its nerves. I winced, but Yulk reached down and put the poor orc's face back together. Then he placed his hand on Thunra's forehead. Leia retired sack, Yulk said. A bright greenish-blue glow emanated from his hand. It had been a while since I'd seen Yulk cast such a powerful healing spell. Once the glow diminished, Thunra coughed and sputtered up some blood and rolled onto his side. Don't get up yet. Catch your breath, Yulk ordered. Gotta fight. Gotta, gotta kill that fucking thing, Thunra replied between coughs. Nick's got this. If you must rejoin the fray, await a good opportunity. Don't get blindsided again. Good advice, Joni gasped. Me, next, please. The wheezing sounds coming from the sorcerer made me look at him. The chunk of metal was lodged firmly in his chest. I followed Yulk over to Joni and realized that if it had impacted just a little to his left, he'd have died instantly. I looked at Yulk and he nodded, so I reached down and pulled the metal clean out of Joni's chest. Yulk once again cast a healing spell, and I looked at the metal. It was a piece of breastplate. The engraving was unique, and one I recognized very well. This is what's left of Graz's armor. I grabbed a rag from my pocket and cleaned the blood off of it, then put the rag and the piece of armor back in my pocket. If we survive this, I'll give it to Graz's wife. No better way to honor my former team leader. Another scream returned my attention to the fight. It came from Yeseth. The creature had managed to bite onto her wrist, but before it could bite through, Nick tried to decapitate it. The thing barely managed to dodge and roll away picking up its arm in the process. It ripped off one of its fingers and threw it at Yeseth hard enough to pierce her knee and pin it to the floor. She let out another scream and the beast began to move in for the killing blow, but once again had to dodge an attack from the boy. It danced backward and put its arm back where it was supposed to be. I don't know if the creature's eyes actually worked, but it appeared to be studying Nick intently. Nick, however, calmly raised a finger at the creature, Rapes Dinu Zack. A massive amount of magical energy flowed from the boy's finger, creating a cyclone that speared its way toward the creature. The thing leapt to the left, but the edge of the wind spear caught it in the side, tearing off a sizable chunk. The creature fell to the ground, doubled over from its wound. Nick continued to point and took a step forward, pooled blood from the beast splashing under his boot. Rapes Dinu Zack. The thing rolled, but not fast enough. The second wind spear caught it in the leg, ripping it to pieces. Nick took another step forward. Labyrinth sack. The hairs on my arm and neck stiffened as the arcane energies ignited the air in front of Nick's finger. The red and yellow flame grew several feet in size, but then condensed to the size of a fist and changed color to blue and white. It flew at the creature faster than my eyes could track and an extremely loud boom sounded before it even made contact. I covered my eyes with my arm as the flash of the flames lit up the chamber. The creature screamed once again, rolling on the floor and writhing in agony. Once the flames died down, Nick stopped pointing and leapt at the creature, sword raised and ready to strike the killing blow. Landing astride the creature, he brought the sword down and my breath caught in my throat as the creature managed a desperate swipe at the blade. I watched it clatter to the floor, right next to two others. The boy was not deterred in the slightest. He slammed the basket guard into the creature's sternum in a move that I was very familiar with, breathtaker strike. The creature's arms spread open as it bounced off of the ground from the blow. Then he did it again and I heard bones crack. The creature struggled to scream, but Nick pinned its arms down with his knees and began punching it in the head over and over. The heavy bronze basket guard took a few blows before cracking the creature's skull. Then it took a few more to turn the creature's head into paste. Blood splashed onto Nick's face, but he kept punching until a small fragment of metal fell out of the beast's exposed brains. Nick barely glanced at before crushing it with what was left of his sword. He paused a moment and then stood up. He dropped his sword and took a couple of steps back before crumpling to the ground. 
Fuck, I muttered. I ran over to the boy. He was absolutely drenched in blood, but I doubted any of it was his. I stared at him for a moment with mixed emotions. On the one hand, I felt kind of good about being right about how dangerous he is. On the other hand, he just went toe-to-toe -to -toe with a boss that floored four over twenties in less than ten seconds. My gaze lingered on the axe in my hand. I shook my head to clear away those thoughts. This is my brother, and I swore to help him on the honor of the Alta clan. If I use this axe on him, I might as well use it on Yulk and my mother as well. It would be akin to spitting in the face of every one of my ancestors. I clipped my axe back onto my belt and checked the boy for injuries. I didn't find any, and looked up at Yulk as he approached. Matri's still out, but she'll live, he informed me. She'll probably forget how to do math or something, though. How's Nick? I think he's fine. He's covered in blood, but I didn't see any cuts, I replied. Damage. Minimal, Nick muttered. I looked down at the boy and then back at Yulk. We both had the exact same confused expression on our faces. I stood up and backed away. Hello? Are you ten? Yulk asked. A few moments trickled by before it responded. Yes. Sorry, I'm new to... Communicating in this way, it answered in a monotone. What happened to Nick? I asked with more concern than I meant to. Nick's sleeping. The altered human was going to attack him and Nick wasn't going to run away. I didn't have a choice, I'm sorry, the AI said, managing to add regret to Nick's voice. Is he going to be okay? I demanded. He's not going to sleep forever, is he? No, he's just resting. I had to push his body very hard. Sorry, did you call that beast an altered human? Yulk asked. Yes, but I don't have much more information than that. I came to that conclusion based on the fact that it is was a human, and it's significantly altered. I do not know why, how, or by whom. I glanced over at the over-twenties. They were all huddled around Matri, thankfully far enough away to be out of earshot. I turned back to the bot boy. So Nick could end up like that? I hesitantly asked. Not if I can help it, Ten replied. But to clarify, anything can end up like that. Not just humans. I felt a mix of relief and concern. It's not that I necessarily trusted the machine, but something about the way it said that made me believe it. However, the thing that turned that human into a monster might still be down here somewhere. Hmm. Well, nothing we can do about that, Yulk muttered. So, Ten, it's not that I think Nick was being intentionally misleading, but it's better to hear it from the source. What exactly are you? Honestly, I'm not entirely certain. Ten said softly. I know I'm an artificial intelligence, but I don't know who made me or necessarily why. Judging from my load order, I am intended to be a guide and translator, but I'm also able to completely override a subject's consciousness for combat purposes. I have a knowledge base, but the knowledge within it is specific to my role as a guide and doesn't answer any of my lingering questions. Also, some of the articles are apparently misleading. Knowledge base? I asked. A sort of specialized library, Yulk answered. Which articles are misleading? The article that details my combat mode, namely. The specifics for triggering it are correct, as well as how to trigger it. But it did far more damage than the article said it would, Ten replied. Subjects may experience unconsciousness for up to 30 seconds after combat mode has ended. Side effects may include nausea and vertigo. That's what it says, but judging from his Delta Y... The way his brain is acting, he's in a deep sleep. Plus, the strain I've put on his muscles means he's going to be sore when he wakes up. What, like an intense workout? I asked with a chuckle. Some people would kill to have a machine do their workouts for them. A little more severe than that, I'm afraid. Brains limit how they move muscles so those muscles don't destroy themselves. I'm able to override that and push muscles much closer to their point of failure. Combined with my ability to near instantly respond to stimuli, this makes a subject much stronger and faster. But it also wears them out faster, I interrupted. I imagine it also may damage internal organs as they struggle to keep up with the new, more intense demands of the muscles. Yolk looked at me with a raised eyebrow and nodded proudly. I may not be the traditional sort of intellectual, but I know muscles. And I'm also familiar with what happens when one artificially pushes them past their limits. The longer or harder one does that, 
the more intense the damage to the rest of the body becomes. So what's his problem then? I asked. Nothing I can't handle, Ten clarified. Would a healing spell help? Yulk asked. Oh, yes, actually, Ten replied excitedly. Why didn't I think of that? Yulk smiled and held his hand over Nick's chest. I turned to check on the over-twenties as Yulk cast his spell. Thunra was helping Matri to her feet. A little wave of anxiety washed over me. How would they react to Ten? If they decided to take advantage of Nick's weakened state to destroy Ten, Yulk and I would be honor-bound to try to stop them. They're way too strong for us, though. The monster may have had the upper hand during the fight, but Yulk and I would have been instantly killed in that fight. Maybe we should keep this little chat to ourselves, I whispered as they began to approach. Probably not a bad idea, Yulk replied. Ten, stay quiet, please. There was no response as the others approached, which I decided to take as Ten agreeing with us. Thunra was grinning like a child, but mixed emotions were playing out on the faces of the others. Like someone whose pupper took off a kid's hand, and now they have to put it down. I stepped in front of Nick as they got closer. This could end badly.